I suppose the seeds to your career were being sown when you saw Alistair Sim in Panto. What element, what aspect of that attracted you the most to acting? I don't know, actually. If I'm honest, I don't know. I just, I'd already said it, that I wanted to be an actress and nobody in my family was anything to do with the profession at all. They were very supportive, but I think they just thought, oh, right, okay, good. But then I know going to see Peter Pan, I thought, yeah, see, people do it. And I want to do that too. It was the first thing I'd seen. I was probably about five. So it, it confirmed rather than ignited what I wanted to do. Very young, isn't it? Yes, it is very young to decide, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is. <laughs> but I was right. <laughs> that was what I wanted to do. Well, you've certainly managed to make a career out of it, so something must have been right. Something went right, yeah. No, it's a, it's a, it's a, an ambition that I think... When you're little, you just think, oh, I just I just want to be I want to be doing everything I can possibly do, whether it's films or probably less television in those days, because obviously, you know, yes. people didn't have a television viewing habit in quite the same way as they do now. But yes, I certainly wanted to be on the stage. Yeah. yeah, really. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But I was very lucky to have supportive parents. So I, I can't uh, say that I wasn't helped along the way by their enthusiasm, if not their knowledge. And then you went to Central Drama School, didn't you? I did, yes. In those days, it wasn't a degree course because I left school at 17. I don't have any A-levels. And uh, in those days, it was an audition to get in. Nowadays, of course, you have to submit A-levels. It's quite a different thing. But in those days, you just auditioned. And if they liked the look of you, then, then you were offered a place. Um, they only offered a place to 10 girls each year. 20 men, 10 girls every year. So if you had the choice to study your A-levels or auditioning, which would be your choice? Oh, for me, definitely yeah. auditioning. It's a different thing now. I mean, in those days, you got, you know, it was the year of grants. It was a very, you know, much more, um, a much more equal way of doing it, I think. You know, you could actually choose what you wanted to do and go for it rather than waiting to see if you got the right results. I mean, good luck to anyone going to drama school now. And I'm very supportive of them, but I think it's, it's quite hard, you know, whereas with me, it was just, if you want to act and we think we spot something that you can offer, then off you go. We'll give you a place. So really different, really different. But certainly, you know, I wouldn't get in now. <laughs> so it certainly worked out for me. <laughs> and then a few years later, you joined what I think is one of the most unique programmes, Jigsaw. How was that to work on? Oh, lovely, yeah. I mean, it wasn't my first job. My first job was in Jack and Ori Playhouse. I was an actress, you know, in various places, stage and, and TV for five years. And then just after I'd had Sophie, I went along to meet the writer and director of Jigsaw. And it was absolutely lovely. I mean, it was just the loveliest job, you know, because it was kind of a lovely mix between acting and a bit of straight-to-camera stuff. I wouldn't have called it presenting then, but, uh, you know, we did actually address the camera. It was such fun. And while you were doing Jigsaw, someone said to you, Oh, you should think about becoming a presenter, didn't they? They did, yeah. yeah. People yeah. used to say, oh, have you thought about presenting? And I think, well, not really. <laughs> but I did go and see a presenting agent, and it was the timing was great. It was just about the time that Sarah was leaving. And the Sarah you speak of, of course, is Sarah Green. Yeah, let's see. Let's see how that goes. And I thought, well, I'm not sure if I want to do that. But actually, the minute I got in the studio, I thought, yes, I did. <laughs> and you did Blue Peter for four years, didn't you? I did, yeah. Lovely. What a nice job. It's just as good as it looks. It's a great programme, isn't it? It is, and it's still going, which is amazing. I think it's now the longest-running children's programme everywhere, which is impressive. Yes, the thing I like about Blue Peter is they change stuff gradually and that it's stuck to the same formula. Absolutely, yeah. Well, they talk to the children, that's the main thing. I think that's what separates it out, really, that they, you know, they still address the audience it was always intended for. Did you ever meet Tony Hart, given that you were doing children's television at the same time and he designed the Blue Peter Baz? Did you ever come into contact with him? Yes, I mean, he was a guest while I was there. Lovely, lovely man. And all the people involved in the setting up of it were absolutely gorgeous. So, you know, it was a really happy family to join. Like I say, all the people, you know, the people who'd, uh, des you know, designed things for it, like Tony, or done the music, you know, were all really super and very enthusiastic. And I think that's that's key in children's programme generally. They tend to be enthusiastic and energetic and all the things you want in people who are making programmes with you. Excellent. And how helpful was Clive Dork as your producer on Jigsaw? 
Yeah, I mean, Clive was very trusting. The people he employed, he let go. You know, he let them have their head and let them explore um, things, which was great because it was really collaborative. You know, so a lot of the things, the sketches and things that we worked on, he would write them and create a character, but then he let Adrian and I go a lot further, you know, which was really lovely. It's very interesting, isn't it, that he went from a vision mixer to a producer? Yeah, and a writer, yeah. Yeah, no, it's a, he knew exactly what he wanted to see on screen, I think because he had been a vision mixer. So, yeah, very, very creative man. Yeah, and still around, I'm happy to say. Still alive and still kicking. Mm-hmm. And with you being a novelist and a presenter, was it a no-brainer to start Twice Upon a Time? <laughs> well, that came out of conversations with friends, really. You know, we'd often go back to books we'd loved, and then we'd start saying, you know, what about that book? What was, you know, what was the book you loved when you were little? And obviously people have key ones that are in common because they were set texts at school or because everyone read them at the same time. But there always seems to be a book that people go, oh, that's my book. That's the book I loved. And for some reason, it just really connects you with the adult you are now talking about a book that you loved when you were little. So um, Carol and Raphael, my producer, and I thought, you know, it would be lovely to do a podcast about this. It, you know, if people want to join in, let's see. And the first people we asked went, oh, yeah. So we knew we were onto something because nobody's turned us down so far. I'm touching wood here. But it is a nice, you know, it doesn't ask much of people except they reread no. a book that they loved. And then we talk about it, you know, so it's a lovely format. And it's uh, a nice one to do because everybody's got a favourite and everybody was a child. So <laughs> we can, we always connect. <laughs> Yes, and I listened to the one with Hayley Mills, which I thought was very impressive that you managed to get her on. Well, yeah, I wanted to be her when I was little, as I probably said to her at the time, and uh, still do, really. She's great. And, of course, many years ago you were in an episode of Doctor Who. Does it blow your mind that you still get invited to the conventions? Well, to be fair, I did four episodes, uh, but it was one story, yeah. I was in I was in four episodes, but yeah, you're quite right. In, in Doctor Who terms, it's an absolute drop in the ocean. So when I was first asked to go to any sort of conventions, I said, I don't really qualify. But what I realised is that people who love Doctor Who love everything about it. So they include you in the family, even if, you know, you live miles down the street, effectively. And it's really lovely because, again, you know, I'm talking about this a lot, but it's the enthusiasm. It really carries you on. And everybody loved Tom Baker because, you know, to my mind, he was the best doctor. Yeah, so even though, you know, mine was a long time ago and only four episodes, I'm delighted if people want to talk about it, acknowledge it. And frankly, people I talk to at, at conventions are much more knowledgeable about it than I am. So I learn something new every time. Do you still watch the programme? No, I don't. No, no. I, I think it's a children's programme, really. And I'm happy if children love it. And I know adults sneak in as well. But uh, yeah, I, I, for me, that was its time. I right, so you've always thought of it as a children's programme. Yeah, when I was little, that's how it was viewed. So maybe I'm just old fashioned. <laughs> but I love the doctors, you know, who come along afterwards. Just amazing people. And they're all such good actors. You know, everybody is chosen. Yes. Because they bring immense talent to it, which is uh, exactly the same with every Doctor. Some of the scripts have been ropey, but everyone who's played the Doctor has always been the right choice. Yeah, but in a programme that's been going on for that long, you know, inevitably, it's not going to be everyone's favourite all the time. But, no. um, yeah, it sats off to everybody who, who loves it, because it's such a lovely programme. You mentioned in interviews about your love for musical theatre. Where did that come from? Oh, who knows? Probably my mother... I mean, my parents certainly had um, records of all the old musicals, which are now in revival, of course, like Oklahoma yes. or Carousel or yeah. West Side Story or Guys and Dolls. So from the earliest age, that music was in the house and I sang along to it long before I knew what musicals meant and then just watched every single one I ever could. The first film I remember seeing was Sound of Music, which I absolutely love. Yeah, that's right. I just thought life should be like this. Everyone should burst into song from time to time. <laughs> oh, I do love them. I get very excited the minute the orchestra starts playing the overture. I think, good, right, here, <laughs> ready. And the production of Oklahoma that is about to, well, I think it's just open now, it transferred from the Young Vic, is is phenomenal. It strips it right back. Yeah. So you really hear a story through it as well, rather than just people dancing around. You have to hear the tune and you think, yeah, yeah, right back. But I love the more modern ones too. You know, I'm a great fan of Sondheim. I think he's masterful and... It's always great to know that people are new, you know, writing musicals now. My 
my son-in-law is in a band with with Dan Gillespie Sells, who co-wrote Everybody's Talking About Jamie, which yes, is a yes. fantastic modern musical. So they're not going to die out anytime soon, I think. But um, the old-fashioned ones, I love too. Well, I don't think you need to worry about musicals dying out. I think they're always going to be here. Hope so. <laughs> Are you working on any novels at this time? I am, yeah, yeah. I've, I'm sort of two thirds, or po- hopefully five eighths, or maybe even a little bit further through book three. Can you say what the title is, or not yet? Uh, I'll keep that actually, because titles change. You can get very attached to one, and then your agent or the publisher goes, "Can we have a think about the title?" Which means it's not going to go that way. So I'll I'll keep it till it's ready. But um, yeah, I've, I've certainly got a working title for it, and I'm enjoying writing it. Which I don't know whether that's a good or bad sign. I'm touching wood again. I hope it's a good sign. Surely it would be a good sign. I hope so. <laughs> Although you were quite nervous, weren't you, to write your first novel? Yeah, it's the first thing I've done on my own like that, really. You know, yes. I've worked a lot as a team player, and especially in live television where you are very definitely one of the team. Yes. So, yes, very nervous about it just being me. So, yeah, yeah, but it's good to be nervous. You know, the older you get, the less chance you get. So I seized the chance, and I'm really glad I did. Do you prefer having an Oski when you're working as a presenter? Um, well, for four years I didn't have one, so I didn't know that they were possible, because obviously Peter, we didn't. Um, but when I left, I thought, oh, well, look at that. <laughs> that's, that's less work, not learning a script. I think it was a great start having no water cue because there's no doubt it keeps you on your toes, toes. And it also does spread the sort of camaraderie, you know, everyone is as responsible for the next person of getting the show on air. But yeah, autocue is quite relaxing, I have to say, you know, it's one less job to do. But you have it's a skill like any other. Yes, because you've got to look at the camera while looking at the screen and look natural. Yeah, yeah you have to you have to sound like you're not reading. And the best people always sound as though it's just coming out of their heads rather than off the screen. So yeah, given the choice I'd probably say, Yes, autocue, thank you. But I'm glad I had that experience of working without it too, because not everybody does. But, you know, it is a skill, and I'm glad I had patient teachers to teach me on the spot, so I I feel very lucky, as ever in my career. There's lots of luck involved. Now, a bit obscure, but people who are watching this might remember the day full of video series which you produced with your second husband, John. How was being off-screen as opposed to on-screen? Well, I I wrote them as well, actually, so, yeah, I had a double role. Um... It was lovely. I mean, working with John was such fun. And because we had access to all those characters like Paddington and Rupert and Super Ted and, you know, the rest, yes. meant that we had, uh, you know, uh, some of a framework to build it around. And we used my kids and friends' kids. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was in one of them as well. But yeah, it was fun. The children didn't sing at all, did they? Different set of voices. We had a choir of children who sang the songs and then we just put a tape down and the kids that we were using sang along so sometimes they didn't know the words but I thought that was part of the charm you know and people still say to me oh they're you know they're really lovely because they're so natural I mean they're they're polished and professional of course they are they were beautifully produced by my husband but um they do have a sort of charm that keeps adults watching to make something that the the adults would like as well and I I hope I hope we succeeded I think we did (laughs) <laughs> One thing that made me laugh was that John thought musicals started with people running with rails and clubs. That's right, yeah, the opening, yeah, the, the overture, yeah, he always said they always start in the same way, yeah. <laughs> so, having worked in telly, do you watch it with a different view? Not anymore, I think, because, first of all, there's so much more of it. So, if you're going to watch like that, you'd be exhausted. You know, we watch much more television than we ever did. Yeah. And we have much more um you know i mean i think it's always been an extraordinary and exciting medium but people who years ago would have said oh i don't think i'm going to do television now do you know the actors directors writers nobody thinks they're above it when it was a new thing i think people thought oh i think oh i might do a bit of telly but obviously i'll move on to something proper and they don't think like that anymore so the production values are amazingly high yes so yes i don't watch anything and think oh this could be better you know and some things i just think are breathtakingly good Yes, it's interesting because I watched behind the scenes feature dads over the years as it's changed my view on how I watch TV. Yeah, no, I think you can know something and you can think that must have been tricky or that's an amazing shot or, you know, but it doesn't spoil my enjoyment, that's for sure.
I read in an interview you were going to send a letter to Walt Disney, weren't you? Because yeah, I wrote one. I never sent it in the end. It was along the lines of, you know, uh, you won't know me, but I'm going to be an actress. So if you've got a part... But yeah, I didn't send it. And I think that was probably just as well. I think when I say I wanted to be Hayley, I don't mean I wanted to replace her. <laughs> I just mean I like the idea of being her because, the, you know, I would not have taken her role. But um, yeah, I think I think it was a good thing for me that I didn't do any child acting. I, I came to it at exactly the right point. Yes, it must be tough being thrown straight into it from a young age. I'm sure it can, yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm lucky. I had some life experience before and some experience of being a student and practising things, you know, before I started out and showed everybody what I was going to do. And is there any other projects you're working on at the moment? No, not at the moment, but then that's situation normal for me. I've been freelance all my adult life, so I never quite know what's around the corner. But in the meantime, at least I've got writing to keep me company and the podcast to prepare. So, you know, very lucky, really, to have things to work on that other people are going to be involved with too. But yeah, who knows what's next? It's always it's always a surprise. <laughs> and who have you got coming on the podcast? Or do you not want to say? No, no, we've got Lorraine Kelly coming on, uh, Connie Huck, and a couple of people who I really want to talk to, but we've just got to get their diaries sorted out. So there'll, there'll be more down the line. I was talking to Diane Morgan the week before last. I think she'll be, she'll be up in the next series. Yeah, it's lovely. An interesting book choice as well, so... Yes, yes, it's really, yeah, I keep using the word, but it's really lucky. So I know you've done serious debate shows like The Rhyme Stuff. If they offered you, have I got news for you, would you ever do a comedy panel show like that? Yeah, why not? Like I say, I'm up for everything, and that's the joy of being freelance with nothing particular to say, this is what I do. You know, I've changed careers in public eye quite a few times from actress to presenter to writer. Yeah. So, yeah, if they if they want to use me there, I'd be perfectly happy. And your ultimate dream job would be to do a musical, wouldn't it? <laughs> oh, dear. I'm not sure. I think it's probably better to leave that in the dreams, uh, you know, because I love it so much. I think I'd probably just cry all the way through rehearsal. It wouldn't be much use. And then, um, yes, uh, I love to sing, but I don't think I could earn my living by it. So I've done panto. That was probably enough for everybody. M mind you, eight times a week, it might, uh, you know, it might, might kill your enjoyment. You never know. Right, probably, probably best to leave that as a dream. It's nice to keep some, isn't it? Keep them fresh. Thanks for your time, Janet. It's been really great chat to see you. Oh, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you. I know we've waited a while, but uh, it's been such fun and it's lovely to go back and revisit things too because much as I like looking forward and, you know, I'm always optimistic about the next bit, it's really lovely to go back and talk about things that happened quite a while ago now, but they're still very dear to me. So thank you for the opportunity. It's been great. Take care.